30 years after purchasing a mysterious 13 ring woman. She suddenly realized that she had been deceived. She gazed at the woman and could hardly believe what she had just heard. She suspected that the appraiser might have made an error. As this situation was entirely new to her. And it seemed equally unfamiliar to the appraiser. She had no clue where to turn. But what happened next left her feeling like royalty. An unidentified Londoner was leisurely strolling through the Middlesex Hospital flea market on a weekly basis. Just west of the city. As she passed by various stands. She noticed that everything appeared old and worn out. With only a couple of bucks in her pocket. She was determined to make her purchase worthwhile. Her attention was drawn to a necklace on one of the stands. But out of the corner of her eye. She spotted an enormous ring that seemed to sparkle. She couldn't resist the magnetic pull of the ring and felt that fate had brought her to it. The woman. Who preferred to remain anonymous. Was in search of something beautiful and luxurious. Although it seemed beyond her reach. She wanted it because it held more significance to her than just an ordinary piece of jewelry. She gingerly picked up the ring and examined it. Captivated by its unique charm. Something about it seemed peculiar. But she felt an inexplicable connection to the ring. The ring was mounted on an incredibly large setting. With a crystal that added to its enchanting allure. It resembled a piece of jewelry from a fairy tale. And the woman was determined to make it her own. It wasn't just a piece of jewelry. It was a talisman that would remind her that with hard work. She could one day attain a real diamond. Little did she know that her life was about to change dramatically. She completed the purchase. Spending her last 10 pounds. Or 13 dollars. On this extraordinary piece. From that day forward. She wore the ring every day. Everywhere she went. Years went by. And her talisman remained faithfully by her side. Despite her humble background. She didn't desire much else. So she held this precious piece close. It made her feel like a princess. Even after three decades. But one day. An unusual trip to the grocery store would turn her life upside down. On a beautiful afternoon. While on her way home from work. The Londoner decided to stop at a nearby grocery store. She collected all the items she needed and proceeded to the checkout line. While waiting. She couldn't help but notice a stranger who was staring intently at her hand. Finding this quite peculiar. She dismissed the thought and continued to wait her turn. Little did she know that the stranger. A mysterious man. Had no intention of letting her out of his sight. His unwavering gaze fixated on her ring. Making the woman increasingly uncomfortable. Her turn at the checkout finally arrived. And she quickly paid for her items before heading toward the exit. However. She couldn't shake the feeling that the man was following her every move. Her suspicion grew. And she began to fear the worst. She was left wondering what the man wanted and how she could get rid of him. With a quickened pace. She walked towards her car. All the while aware of the man tailing her. She attempted to lose him in the crowd while keeping him in her peripheral vision. But he seemed unshakable. Uncertain of the man's intentions. She pondered if she was being paranoid. Suddenly. The gap between them closed. And she felt him right behind her. She spun around to confront him. And what he said took her completely by surprise. The mystery man had been trailing her because her costume jewelry had caught his eye. With a sense of eagerness in his eyes. He asked her something that left her with many questions. Seeing the panic on her face and the man's unrelenting gaze on her hand. He quickly inquired if she would mind showing him a closer look at her ring. Annoyed by the stranger's audacity and suspecting a potential scam. She rudely brushed him off and hurried away. She had always kept her talisman by her side. But on this particular day.
she was in such a rush that she forgot to put it on. It had become a daily ritual for her to wake up and wear the ring on her finger. However, that day, she was frazzled late. And as she hurried to get dressed and out the door, she realized the ring was not on her finger. The ring held immense value for her. And her immediate thought was to go back home to retrieve it. This was particularly unsettling given her previous experience with the mysterious man at the grocery store. Taking the stairs two by two, she began searching her bedroom. The usual place for the ring. To her dismay, it wasn't there. She knew she should have been more cautious. As something about that man had felt off. And her gut had signaled as much. With her eyes widening and her breaths becoming ragged and harsh, she turned her bedroom upside down but couldn't locate her precious costume ring. It was only when she entered her bathroom that something jogged her memory. There. Standing prominently next to the sink in all its glory. Was the ring. She had placed it there to remind herself to put it back on after brushing her teeth but had forgotten. Relief washed over her. But her mind was still troubled. She couldn't stop thinking about the strange man who had shown such an uncanny interest in her ring. He seemed to believe that her crystal ring held some value beyond what she had imagined. Whose ring could it have originally belonged to? She believed that her encounter with the man had provided enough reason for her to take the ring to Sotheby's in London. Perhaps they could answer her questions and alleviate her anxiety. She couldn't help but wonder if the ring had once belonged to someone famous. It was old. With tarnished silver and plenty of dirt. But what hidden secrets did it hold? A couple of anxious days later. She would finally uncover the mind-bending truth. The suspense was almost unbearable. And a sense of dread washed over her. Sotheby's had informed her that they would need a couple of days to run tests on the stone. And her heart sank. Then. Sotheby's jewelry department in London confirmed the stone's authenticity. It turned out that her ring was a massive 26 karat cushion shaped white diamond dating back to the 19th century. The Londoner couldn't believe it. She was convinced there must be some mistake. How could she have been wearing a ring of such extraordinary value all this time? Sotheby's had all the answers. Jessica Wyndham, who headed the auction house's jewelry department, explained that a ring of this value was likely owned by someone in the royal family during the 19th century. Due to the slightly dulled and deeper diamond cutting, it could deceive people into thinking it wasn't a genuine stone. The antique cushion shape and the older style of cutting didn't reflect light as brilliantly as modern stones. Cutters back then aimed to preserve all the weight of the stone rather than maximizing its brilliance. This antique shape and older style had concealed its true value for all those years. Jessica Wyndham elaborated on why it took some time to authenticate and value the ring. We confirmed that it was indeed a diamond. Tested it with the Gemological Institute of America. And that dictated the price. She said. Jessica Wyndham told the anonymous woman that the ring could fetch as much as £350,000, approximately $450,000, if it were auctioned. The head of the auction house continued to explain that the stone's cut probably contributed to the fact that it didn't sparkle as much. Coupled with the dirt. No one would have suspected it to be real. But they had no inkling of its true value when they acquired it. The Londoner recalled standing at the flea market. And the ring had indeed sparkled. Which had captured her attention. Perhaps her talisman had shown just for her. Having lived a life from paycheck to paycheck. Another person's discarded item had become her treasure. And it had entirely transformed her life. The ring was sent to auction and sold for a staggering sum of £656,750, nearly $850,000. Not only did this unexpected windfall make her life considerably easier. But she finally realized that she had been a princess all along. But how can one determine if their costume jewelry holds any value? Dust swirled around. Casting mysterious beams of light in the dim. 
cavernous workshop as Betty quietly pushed open the heavy, creaking door on a Saturday morning. A deep sigh escaped her lips, she knew she had to do it now. The workshop had to be cleared out. And the items had to be sold. Desperation gnawed at her, her late husband had left her with nothing. But the discovery Betty made that early Saturday morning completely altered her perception of her departed husband, when she finally managed to make her way into Wilbert's workshop. She swiftly noticed that something was amiss. A thick layer of dust had settled on everything except for one spot on the ground beside the workbench, it had been recently disturbed. With her son. Mike's assistance. Betty relocated the bench to the dust-free area on the ground, revealing a concealed trapdoor beneath it. Two weeks had passed since her husband's passing, and Betty still felt a long way from moving on. Their home was filled with reminders of his scent and presence. Initially, she didn't quite know where to start. The bedroom, where they had spent the most time together, seemed like an emotionally challenging place to begin. The thought of starting there was daunting, and she worried it might demotivate her. Having completed the rest of the house, she had only one more place to tackle, his workshop. Located in the shed just behind the house, her husband had devoted himself to the workshop after his retirement, spending nearly every day there. She had inquired about his projects a few times, and he had always mentioned tinkering with old machines, keeping himself engaged in his post-retirement years. With her mental preparations in place, Betty headed towards the workshop with boxes in tow, ready to sort through her husband's belongings and decide what to keep and what to part with. Upon arrival, she was met with a locked door, and she had no clue where he had kept the key. She hadn't the faintest idea about the contents within. Frustrated by the locked door, she decided to abandon her attempts to access the shed and call the local locksmith to assist with the situation. As she awaited the locksmith's arrival, she couldn't help but wonder why she had never ventured into the workshop in all the ten years since her husband had passed away. The locksmith swiftly opened the door, taking only a few minutes to complete the task. After settling the bill, he left, leaving Betty alone with the workshop and the mysteries held within. It was time to uncover what her husband had been up to all these years. Upon inspection, everything in the workshop appeared just as it should for a place dedicated to craftsmanship. Betty did notice, however, that the area seemed more cluttered and disorganized than she had expected. But then again, Wilbert had never been particularly concerned with keeping things in order. As she ventured deeper into the workshop, Betty couldn't help but notice that the place was far dustier than it should have been. After a few hours, her son Mike paid her a visit. Betty sat him down and shared her unusual experience with the workshop. She then led her curious son to the workshop, pointing at the workbench she wanted him to move. With excitement, Mike eagerly moved the bench, revealing an unexpected feature, a hidden entrance beneath it. Both mother and son were taken aback by the discovery of a trapdoor within the workshop. Mike opened the trapdoor, which surprisingly wasn't locked, unveiling a staircase leading downwards. With Mike leading the way and assisting Betty, they descended the stairs together their curiosity growing. They continued down the staircase. Upon reaching the end of the stairs, they found themselves in a garage, complete with a single, sleek-looking car. Upon closer inspection, they realized that there was a pre-programmed route in the car's navigation system, indicating a 30-minute drive. At that very moment, Mother and son knew exactly what to do next. Betty took her place in the passenger seat. While Mike used a small remote to open the garage door. They set off on the predefined journey. And Betty finally had an answer to one of her many questions. She knew where they were but had no idea where they were headed. 
The garage they had just left belonged to one of the houses in their neighborhood, which had been on the market for a long time without finding a buyer. Betty had considered buying it at one point. But when she couldn't find a listing for the house, she gave up on the idea. Now, they were en route to solve the mystery. After nearly half an hour of driving, Betty and Mike found themselves near the city limits. In front of another old house. Also up for sale. It was eerily similar to the previous property. And Betty wondered if there was a connection or if it was just a coincidence. Betty observed the property and noticed that the exterior of the house was in dire need of repair. It required cleaning, painting and maintenance to even be slightly presentable. She couldn't fathom how anyone expected to sell a house in such a state for a reasonable price. Meanwhile, Mike checked out the front of the house and, after ringing the doorbell with no response, he tested the doorknob and even tried pushing on a window. However, he couldn't find a straightforward entry point. Suddenly, he had an idea about how to gather more information about this peculiar property. As Betty explored the car in greater detail, she noticed that it appeared rather ordinary, with a clean interior and nothing particularly noteworthy. But when she opened the glove box, she found a large, black bag that completely filled the compartment. When Betty opened the bag, she was almost taken aback by what she found inside neatly packed hundred-dollar bills. There had to be thousands of dollars in there. She carefully moved the money aside and discovered multiple sets of keys and plastic cards hidden among the cash. Betty could barely keep her hands from trembling as she saw Mike approaching the car. She called him over. And at first, she was stunned by the discovery of the money. However, her attention was soon drawn to the driver's licenses within the bag. Each license featured a picture of her late husband. But the names on them were all different. Betty and Mike couldn't believe their eyes. Why would anyone need five fake identities? A terrible feeling washed over Betty as she realized that perhaps she hadn't known her late husband at all. It seemed like an enormous secret had been kept from her. But the discovery of the bag sparked another idea in Mike's mind. After trying and failing to gather information from the neighbors, Mike took the various sets of keys from the black bag and attempted to use them on the front door of the house. After some hesitation, he successfully unlocked the door. But he decided not to contact the police until they had some answers. There had to be a reason for all of this. Though Mike was apprehensive about what they might find, he wanted to ensure their safety. So he helped Betty inside. They locked the door behind them. Not knowing who might be aware of the money and whether this was part of a larger plot. The interior of the house mirrored its exterior, run down and neglected. Only a trickle of light passed through the boarded up windows and curtains. It was evident that there was no power in the house and it appeared as though nobody had been there for quite some time. Perhaps that was the intention all along. To navigate the dark and eerie house. Mike turned on his phone's flashlight, guiding them as they searched for any clues that could link the place to Wilbert. Betty remained silent but stayed close to Mike the entire time. He could sense her nervousness. And it was a shared feeling after all they had experienced and it seemed that their journey was far from over. They searched carefully. But despite the hidden hatch in the workshop, they couldn't find any signs of a secret part of the house or another concealed room. Mike suggested that their luck might improve if they searched upstairs since a house like this could have an attic or hidden compartments. Although Betty didn't want to split up from Mike. She was exhausted. The thought of climbing the stairs seemed daunting so she reluctantly allowed him to go upstairs on his own. She cleared a spot on the couch and took a seat, feeling overwhelmed by the entire situation. While she waited for Mike's return, she couldn't help but feel frustrated. The realization of how much Wilbert had lied to her weighed heavily on her. Regrettably, 
There was no way to confront him or ask him about the truth now. And she was angered that he hadn't offered any insight into his real life. It seemed like answers might forever elude her. Just when Betty was on the verge of giving up hope. Mike called out to her from upstairs. His tone indicated excitement. And she hurried up the stairs as fast as she could. Her heart raced. And she could barely see as she ascended the stairs. But she found Mike in one of the adjoining rooms, which turned out to be a bedroom. He pointed at a painting on the wall. And Betty moved closer. Squinting to discern its details. To her surprise. It was a stunning portrait of their family. Betty couldn't comprehend why it was there or if Wilbert had ever intended for them to see it. Mike even chuckled at her reaction. Mike stepped forward and carefully removed the painting from the wall. Revealing something unexpected. Behind the painting. Embedded in the wall. Was a safe with an envelope stuck to the outside. He opened the envelope and shared its contents with Betty. It was a letter from Wilbert that explained everything. The story sounded like the plot of a movie. And they could hardly believe it. Wilbert hadn't been proud of it. But he had done work with questionable people and criminals to provide for the family. He had discovered safe houses where people could hide from the police or conduct illegal activities without interference. It had all started by accident years ago. A memory suddenly flashed in Betty's mind. A conversation they had once had about an abandoned house similar to this one. Wilbert had mentioned wanting to buy a rental property. But Betty had thought it too risky to invest their money that way. He had disagreed and wanted them to have a safety net. So he had purchased this property without telling her. The house had appeared empty and dilapidated. But one day. Wilbert had found a stranger hiding inside. A criminal had been using the house to conduct illegal activities during a crime wave in the city. And he offered to pay Wilbert to let him use the house secretly. It had been too good of a deal to turn down. And he had kept expanding his safe houses until the police finally cleaned up the area. And the organized criminals moved on to another location. However. This still didn't explain the safe. Mike flipped over the letter. And there was writing on the other side. It explained that Wilbert had started selling everything before his death but needed a place to hide the funds from the government. At the bottom of the page. There was a code, a combination. Mike used the combination to open the safe. Revealing a substantial amount of money. More than they could have imagined. Betty was left unsure of what to do with it. They considered notifying the police but ultimately decided against it. Wilbert had wanted them to enjoy themselves and be financially secure. And that was precisely what they would do. In addition to the money. There was the painting that Betty would cherish forever.